From the Gospel of John, we're only going to focus on three verses on John 19, verses 28 through 30. Last week, I spent a lot of time in these verses. And this week, I'm going to spend more time. So let me start out with prayer because I need God to help me focus. It, it's hard to just talk to a camera like this. There's no faces. There's no you know, responses. I can't see your reactions. Um, and so it's hard to just sit here and talk to a camera, you know, so pray for me. If you're sitting there watching, pray for me that God will help me and give me the words to speak. And of course we know the Bible is his word, so it's his words. Okay. So let's pray right now. God, we just come before you, Lord, we praise you, Jesus, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you, you are our savior. Lord, in Isaiah 43, 11, you say, I even I am the Lord and there is no savior besides me. Lord Jesus, we know you are the Lord. And Lord, even this uh, situation around the world right now with this virus, God, we pray, Lord, that you would have your will. Lord, that you would use this situation to bring many people to yourself. Lord, that so many people don't know you in this world. They don't have peace. Um... They don't know what's going to happen to them when they die. They don't have assurance of eternal life. Jesus, uh, you promised that we can know. In 1 John 5, 13, you say through your spirit, through the gospel, through, through the, the, uh, the disciple John, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Lord, we know that uh, Christianity is the only religion that even promises eternal life. Other religions don't even, it's a, it's a hope, it's a wish, it's a, well, I wonder, I'll try my best, maybe I'll get eternal life, or maybe I'll have some sort of life after death, depending on the religion. But, Lord, we know that the, the truth, you've revealed yourself, Lord, through the Bible, and that we can know. And so, whether we catch a virus and get sick and die or not, we have the hope of eternal life, Lord. We know we're all going to die one day. And we have the, the true hope, the confident assurance that we will be with you, Lord, where there is no sickness or virus or suffering or death. So we pray, God, you would use this, first of all, to bring many people to you, and also, Lord, that when it is your time and your will and your way that you would end it. And we know that you will because you are sovereign. You are in control of all things. Lord, uh, you are all powerful. And uh, so we know that you are in control and we, we choose to trust you, Lord. Please help me today as I'm preaching just to have uh, strength. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. May any words that are just from me that they would fall to the ground. But that the words are, the words that are from you, Lord, that they would uh, touch our hearts and change us. Lord, reveal yourself to us more and more. I pray for our, our church, Lord, our, for our people. You would give them strength today. Give them peace. Give them comfort, Lord. Help them in their, in their trials and their sufferings. Lord, you, you tell us in this world you will have trouble, but... Take heart, I give you my peace. So Lord, please pour out your peer, your peace in our hearts. And we just praise you, Jesus, for who you are. And we lift up your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in to our sermon. We've been going through the Gospel of John now for over a year. And so now we're in John 19. Okay, and last week... I focused primarily on verse 29 and talking about um, how Jesus received the, when he's hanging on the cross at this point in John 19, and he's, he's suffering tremendously. He's been whipped on his back 39 times with the cat of nine tails. He's had a crown of thorns beaten down on his head. He's been shamed. He's been He's been mistreated. He's taking our sins on himself, even though Jesus never sinned. He's taking our sins on himself, and he's hanging there. And last week we focused on verse 29 of how this, this wine that was given to him 
right before he dies, is very symbolic of how Jesus receives the wine of the death for us. Even though we deserve that, Jesus took our sins on himself. And, and he didn't just take our sins, but he took the consequence of our sins. And the judgment and the, the payment, the shame and the punishment for our sins. He took that from his father. Okay, so we focused on that last week. So we're going to actually focus on verses 28 and 30. So last week we were focused on verse 29, but this week we're going to focus on verse 28 and verse 30. So let's read it together in your Bibles. Uh, please open up to John 9. I do not have all the scriptures in your languages on the screen. Uh, it's hard to fit all of the scriptures on the screen and make it big enough so you can actually see it from the camera. So I'm sorry about that. I know normally when I'm with you, I put all your, uh, your languages up on the screen, but I, it's too hard right now to do that. You can't see it. So anyways, I trust that you have your own Bible. So turn with me, John 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He died. He physically died. Okay, so we're going to focus on this phrase right here, okay, in verse 28 and in verse 30. All was now finished, and then Jesus says right before he dies on the cross, he says, it is finished. Okay, now what does this mean? It is finished. It. What is it? It. It is finished, okay? Now, we, it's important for us to understand, um, in the original Greek, verse 30, it is finished is all one word, uh, tetelestai. Now, obviously, I'm probably not saying it correctly for those of you Greek speakers here in Cyprus, okay? But this is the ancient Greek, okay? The biblical Greek, tetelestai. It's, it's one word, finished, it's finished. Okay, now it's important that we really dig into what does this actually mean. Okay? So I looked this up. You can, uh, maybe sometime I can teach all of you uh, how to do what's called a word study. I'm actually teaching at uh, a Bible school here that I teach at. Um, and I'm teaching them starting tomorrow on how to do word studies. And it's good to learn how to look up uh, a word in the original language and then trace it throughout uh, the scriptures and see how it's used and see what it means. Now this word is used, uh, I think it's 25, 30 times in the New Testament, okay, in different forms, okay, but this word uh, means to accomplish something, to end something, to fulfill or complete it. So like many of you, 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 you work. I mean, we all work. We have jobs in some way, okay? But when you start a project, like let's say you're doing uh, ironing clothes, okay? And when that work is done, you're like, I'm finished, now I can go do something else. Now, when you do that work and you say, I'm finished, the next day, you have to do more right? Okay, and the next day, and the next day. So it's not completely finished, it's just you're done for that period of time, just for a little while, okay? But it's, it's un we need to understand this word, tetelestai, okay? When Jesus says it is finished, he's saying the work that he came to do is complete, never needing to be done again, okay? So it, this word, tetelestai, in English grammar, it is what's called a, um, a, a uh, 
I can't even remember what it's called, which it doesn't matter in the grammar, okay? But it, notice at the bottom here, it says, it is something that has completely been done and never needs to be done again. Okay, so we're going to spend our the rest of this sermon on, okay, Jesus says, it is finished. The work that he came to do is finished and it never ever, ever, ever needs to be done again. It's complete. Okay, well, what is it? What is the work that he came to do? Okay, he says this on the cross. So what has been finished or completed? So let's move on. Okay, now we are in John 19. And normally I don't like to jump around in the Bible so much. Many of you know when I'm teaching you, I like to just stay in one passage. It's called expository teaching. You just read through verse by verse and, you know, expose what God is saying. But I do think it's important that we, we, we're going to jump around quite a bit today. Okay? So if you feel lost, this is being recorded on Facebook. You can go back and you can watch it over and over again. And you can, you can pause the video, write down the scriptures. So I'm going to be just going very fast through these scriptures, okay? So, what is it that Jesus finished? What work did he come to finish, okay? I have here, Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets and made a way for us to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, we're going to work through this. When Jesus came and he preached about the gospel, it says many times Jesus went around town to town preaching the gospel, okay? And it says here in Mark 1, 14 to 15, now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So what Jesus is saying is, God made a promise all the way back in Genesis 3.15. He said, Eve, you have taken of this fruit that I told you not to eat, and I told you that you would die. You'd be a spiritual separation, physical death. You'll go through pain when you give birth to children. All of these curses have come on you because you sinned. Okay? And so, all of a sudden, the kingdom of God, that God created on this earth, where He would rule and reign as our King, and where we as His people would rule with Him, and live in an honorable uh, place as his kingdom children, all of that got messed up. Okay? And, and God made a promise back to Eve in Genesis 3.15. I will send someone from your seed, from your descendants, who will crush the head of the serpent. Okay? The devil. The devil is... Uh, an opposing kingdom. A kingdom that is against the kingdom of God. And so this promise was ultimately that Jesus would restore the kingdom back to the way that he originally designed it. For him to be our Lord and King and ruler, and for us to rule and reign with him as his honorable children. Okay, so let's work through this. Okay, now Jesus said here, the time is fulfilled. This is not the same word to tell us die. It's a different word in the original Greek. But to fulfill, this word means like, I have this cup here, and it's got water in it. If the cup were filled all the way, he's saying, if time were waiting from the beginning of the promise of Genesis 3.15, I'm going to send my uh, a descendant from you, and then time passes, and then Abraham comes along, and God comes to Abraham and says, through your seed, not seeds, not through your descendants, but through one of your seed, Singular, he made a promise, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through Jesus, the Messiah. Okay, and all this time, they're waiting, 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 and then now the time is full, it's, been, it's, it's time, like the cup is full of time, now is the time for the kingdom to be restored. That's what Jesus is saying here. Okay, so let's move on, because i got to go through this quick. Okay, now as we move on, we're going to talk about when Jesus said, it is finished, that in order for God's kingdom to be restored, 
in order to to enter for us to be part of God's kingdom that is restored for us to enter the kingdom of God we have to have what is called righteousness okay now righteousness is an honorable status in which we can be accepted accepted by God we can be acceptable to God and be honorable in order to enter God's kingdom you have to be honorable you have to be 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 righteous you have to to um, to honor God okay so I'm gonna work through this okay now there's two ways in which you can become uh, uh, there's two ways to become righteous or honorable okay and we're gonna see here um, it's not possible, these two ways are not possible on our own, okay? But there are two ways in which to become honorable, okay? Number one is to have achieved honor. To achieve something means that you earn it. So if you work for something and you achieve it, then, then you did something to get it, okay? So achieved honor, it'd be like a, you know, a, a famous person, like, I like sports. I like to watch. Uh, I don't really watch sports on TV much, but of course, I'm a I'm a football coach here, and so it, a a person who comes from a very poor family, uh, who is not known by anyone, they're not famous or anything, and then they work really hard and they practice their their sport. Like let's say it's football. Okay, they practice that sport every day and they work 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 and then they get to a place where they become very good at their at, at what they do and they achieve they earn a place of of respect and honor like it was something they did no one else did it for them they did it they worked for it now of course god is actually the one who's given them the ability to do that okay but they they had to work for achieve that place of honor and respect and fame okay so that's the first way achieved when you have to work and earn it okay and the second way is what's called ascribed honor which is when someone gives it to you when someone ascribes it to you they, they just give it to you okay now many of you come from cultures with the caste system so depending on the family that you're born in, you were ascribed a certain level of honor depending on the family you were born in. It has nothing to do with you or you did not achieve this place of honor. So if you're in the highest caste in your country, you're not in that caste because you earned it. It's because it was ascribed to you. Okay? Um, so I'm just trying to explain the two different ways in which honor can come. Okay, now the Bible, you know, righteousness is a, an honorable status in which where we are pleasing to God and acceptable to God. And we have to be honorable to be acceptable to God. God is full of honor, but we'll see here in a little bit how we fall short of honoring God. Okay, so let's move on and we'll come back to this idea of, of achieved honor and ascribed honor. Now we'll see that we as people, we cannot achieve honor before God on our own. That's why Jesus actually came. Jesus came to restore our honor to the Father, to make us acceptable to the Father, for us to be declared righteous. Okay, let's move on. Okay, what has been finished or completed? Okay, now we're going to talk about this word righteousness. Okay, pretty much the rest of this time, because Jesus ultimately came to finish the work of righteousness, to, to, to be righteous, to show us what righteousness is, and to restore our righteousness and our honor to the place that God always intended us to be. Okay, perfectly honorable in his sight. He created us to be honorable and to rule and reign with him in his kingdom. Okay, so let's read this. This comes from Romans chapter 10. Um, 
don't turn there in your Bible unless you want to, because I'm going to be jumping through these, these pretty fast. Okay, the next passage you want to turn to is Romans chapter 3, and that's where we're going to stay mostly. Okay, Romans 3, but I am going to jump back and forth through a few other scriptures. But if you want to turn in your Bible to Romans 3 and hold your place there, that's where we're going to spend a lot of our time. Okay, but in Romans 10 here, these people, these are actually the Israelites. Paul is talking about them at this point. The Jews, the chosen people of God, okay? And they are trying to achieve honor through obeying the law. Okay, let's see what this says. This is the Apostle Paul speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit in Romans 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, for the Jews, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. He's saying they have a zeal means like passion, like, oh, I'm going to seek God, which is good. It's good to have passion. Verse 3, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So here's what Jesus is saying. I mean, here's what the, the Holy Spirit saying through, through the Apostle Paul, that the Jews are very religious people, okay? They, they try to, or they think they are, obeying God's laws, although they added all, they, they totally misinterpreted many of them and added their own laws to what God actually was saying or interpreted them to say different things, okay? And of course, this is why the Jews as a nation did not like Jesus because he comes along and tells them they're wrong, that they've added all these laws and they're saying what God is not saying in his word. They made up their own rules, okay? So he's saying they have like a zeal for God, like passion, like, oh, we want to be religious. But they were ignorant, which means they did not understand the truth. They were trying to become righteous or to achieve honor on their own. They were trying to achieve their honor and their righteousness. They were trying to establish it, seeking it on their own. Now this says... Verse 4, for Christ is the end, teleo, okay? This, this word comes from tetelestai, or tetelestai comes from this word. This is a, it's a, a foundation, a root word, okay? Jesus is the end of the law, it says. Now, this is talking about the sacrificial and ceremonial law. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments and the moral law in which he's not saying, you know, disobey God, do whatever you want, don't obey his, his moral law. He's not saying that. But Christ is the end of the, the ceremonial and sacrificial system. You can read the book of Hebrews. It's all about that. Okay? Je all of those laws and commands were all about Jesus, and Jesus is the end of it. He came to finish. It is finished. The Old Covenant, okay, is finished because it was all about Jesus. Jesus. Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus obeyed all the moral law. And Jesus, all of the sacrificial laws and ceremonial laws are all about who Jesus is and what he has come to do. The work that Jesus achieved for us. Achieved honor. Jesus achieved this honor, okay? So that's why it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay, let's move on. I know I'm going kind of fast. So now we're going to spend the rest of our time in Romans chapter 3. Okay? So Romans chapter 3. And uh, we're going to start, we're going to go from verses 20 to 26, the, pretty much the rest of the time. I will... Go to a few other verses, I'll jump around, but this is where we're going to stay, okay? So keeping in mind, Jesus has finished the work of, of achieving righteousness and ending the law, the, 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 the 
ceremonial and sacrificial laws that were set up in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Okay? Let's look at Romans 3, verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Now this word justified, okay, not, those of you who speak Greek here, okay, now we, in Cyprus we, we speak, uh, it's a modern Greek here, it's not the ancient, okay, but many of these words you, you can, uh, Greek speakers can understand, okay, the word justified is dikeao, okay, dikeao, okay, which comes from the word righteous, which is dikaos. Dikaos. Okay, is righteous. Justified is dikao. Being declared righteous. Okay? Being declared honorable. So this says, by doing, by obeying the laws of God, the Ten Commandments, and, and, and the uh, sacrificial system. No, no one's going to be justified. No one's going to be declared righteous. No one's going to be given a an a, a um, honorable status before a God by doing something. It's not by works. It's not by achieving it. Okay? Now, if you read Galatians and, and into Romans, we see that it, it says... If you're going to try to achieve your honor before God by doing good works, then you have to actually obey all the commands. Galatians 3 says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to abide by everything written in the book of the law. So if you want to achieve your honor before God, then you've got to meet the standard, which is perfection, perfect honor of God all the time. You have to honor God perfectly, 100% your whole life. If you want to achieve righteousness, if you want to be justified, the keao, if you want to be declared righteous, okay? So let's move on. It says, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. God never gave us the law for us to try to obey it to become righteous, to become honorable. The law just shows us where we're, where we're not honorable, where we, we disrespect God, where we rebel against God. It just reveals to us. Okay, let's keep moving on. Okay? So by works of the law, no human being will be justified or declared righteous or declared honorable. We see here that righteousness or honor cannot be achieved by doing good things or even by obeying God's commands. Okay? So remember these two ideas of honor, achieved and ascribed. So we cannot achieve honor. Righteousness. We cannot achieve honor. We cannot get an honorable status before God by something that we do. That's where Jesus comes in. Okay? Jesus, we'll see this, he gives ascribed honor to us. It's not something we work for and do. It's something he worked for and he achieved for us. Okay? Someone doing dishes? <laughs> okay. Uh... It says here, Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets and made a way for us to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so let's see. How does Jesus fulfill the law and the prophets? Now, Romans 3, stay there the whole time. Okay, even though I'm jumping back and forth from some other scriptures, stay in Romans 3 because that's what we're working through. Okay, Romans 3, 21 and 20, 22 says, but now the righteousness, the honor the acceptable, to be in a place acceptable to God and to be honorable to God, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So he's saying the Old Testament actually revealed to us. They, they, they shed light. They give, um, it's a foreshadow. They, they point to the righteousness of God. But we can't become acceptable by obeying the law. Okay? But the law, the ceremonial and sacrificial laws are all about Jesus. All these sacrifices that God said to make in the Old Testament, it was all about Jesus, the Lamb of God. We'll see this, okay? 
And it says in verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So we'll get to that, that we cannot achieve righteousness. We cannot achieve honor before God. We cannot become acceptable to God by achieving it on our own. It's through faith in Jesus who Jesus achieved it for us. Let's keep moving on. So the question is, where does the law and the prophets bear witness about Jesus? There's many people who believe that, uh, of course, Jews, non-Messianic Jews, those who don't accept Jesus as the Messiah, believe the Old Testament, uh, particularly the, the Pentateuch, the first five books, depending on the religion or what you come from, they believe those are the most important. They don't believe the New Testament. But Jesus actually said in John 5, you search the scriptures, and he was talking about the Old Testament, because that's the only scriptures they had when Jesus was on this earth. The New Testament had not been written yet. Okay? Jesus said in John 5, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you will have eternal life. And he was talking about the law. You think that by obeying all these commands and these laws that you're going to have eternal life. That's what he says. You search the scriptures. Hey, baby. Baby. That's my sweet baby girl over there. She's preaching. She's saying, amen, daddy. Preach it. <laughs> okay. She's saying, oh, she's, she's not saying. <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted by my cute baby. Okay. Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life by obeying these things. And Jesus says, but these scriptures, the Old Testament, bear witness about me. They speak about me. And he said, but you are not willing to come to me to have eternal life. That was in your face. Like those of you who think that, oh yeah, the Old Testament laws are most important. We don't believe in the New Testament. Okay, Jesus says, hey, those are about me, about Jesus. Okay, and then he goes on in Matthew, I'm sorry, in John 5. I might have said Matthew 5. It was John 5, not Matthew 5. John 5, he goes on and he says, hey, you, you, you love Moses? Moses wrote about me, and you're not willing to come to me. Okay, so let's look. Where do the law and the prophets speak about Jesus and, and, and reveal manifest righteousness, okay? Let's look. I'm not going to do a lot. It's all, I mean, the whole Old Testament is ultimately pointing to Jesus, okay? But look at Leviticus 1, 3, and 4. Last week we looked at Leviticus 14, I think it was, okay? Where does the Old Testament, where does the law speak about Jesus, okay? It says this, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. This is a, a, a little lamb, a sheep, a little lamb. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. Notice that word accepted. He may be honored before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Last week I talked about the atonement, you know, when God set up the sacrificial laws, there were like the five different offerings, burnt offering, sin offering, grain offering, you know, there's five different offerings and then more, but there's some other offerings. Okay. The five, five main ones in Leviticus. Okay, a, a burnt offering, they were to take a, 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 a lamb, that a male lamb that was without blemish. That means there was no spots, um, there was nothing on, the sheep looked perfect. And it represented the, the righteousness and honor of Jesus, that he is perfect and he is honorable and he became the lamb for us. So Leviticus is pointing to the sacrifice that, that sin has to be paid for by death. Okay, Leviticus 17, verse 11, says the life of the flesh is in the blood, so the, so the blood must be spilled out so that death happens because sin leads to death. And when there's no blood, there's no more life. So Jesus 
Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. So Romans 3, when it says Jesus fulfills righteousness, or, or the law and the prophets point to Jesus, point to righteousness, they're pointing to Jesus. It's, it's an Old Testament picture of Jesus. Jesus is the lamb who died for us and shed his blood so that we could be forgiven. Okay? We're going to keep moving on. We're back in Romans again. Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So we saw, where did the law, just one place in, in Moses' law in the Pentateuch, did he, does it point to Jesus? Now, where, where in the prophets does it point to Jesus? Okay, of course, so many prophecies. 365 prophecies from the... From the Old Testament, Jesus fulfilled. He filled up all those prophecies that God said, this will happen, and this will happen, and this will happen, and this will happen. The Messiah will fulfill this. He fulfilled 365 out of the 850-something prophecies. There's still prophecies yet to come that Jesus is fulfilling now and will fulfill. Okay? But in... In the Old Testament, where do the prophets bear witness to the righteousness of Jesus? Okay, look, Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11. It says this, this was written like 600 years before Jesus stepped out of heaven as the Son of God and came down and became human. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, Jesus. The so the Father was the will of the Father to crush him, Jesus. He has put him to grief. Grief. He, God the Father, has put Jesus to grief, to suffering, when his soul makes an offering for guilt. So when Jesus is dying on the cross, it's not just the physical suffering of being beaten and the nails in his hands and feet. It's a, it's a spiritual. His soul was suffering. The same suffering that we we would experience in hell, Jesus is suffering. Okay? He's making an offering for guilt. Guilt means to be to be dishonorable, to be uh, to, to sin, to, to disobey God's commands, uh, to turn away from God, to rebel against Him and His His King Lordship in our life. Okay? He shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11, out of the anguish, out of the suffering of his soul, of Jesus' spirit, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, that's talking about Jesus, Jesus is righteous, Jesus is honorable, shall the righteous one make many, to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquity. So Jesus, when he's hanging on the cross, he's taking our, our, our rebellion against God himself, our sins, our dishonor of God that we do. We have dishonored God in ways. Okay, we've, we've all broken the Ten Commandments in different ways. Okay, so we've dishonored God. We have iniquities. We have rebellion against the Lordship of God. And Jesus... Jesus took the weight of the consequence, the, the suffering, the, the spiritual anguish in his soul. He took what we deserve that we would receive in hell. He took that on himself at the cross so that many could be accounted righteous, so that he could ascribe righteousness, he could ascribe honor, he could give honor, give righteousness to us. Who believe. So Jesus was hanging on the cross, and the prophets are bearing witness to this, as it said in Romans 3. Okay, so back to Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God, or the honor of God, has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So we only looked at two passages, where Leviticus points to Jesus, the righteous, who would come be the sacrificial lamb, and Isaiah, the prophets, bear witness to Jesus, who would fulfill righteousness, who would be righteous, and take the sin of those who are not, okay? 
Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe. So Jesus achieved righteousness and an honorable status for us. We could never achieve it. We could never be good enough. We could never be honorable enough. And we can receive this through faith in Jesus. We can receive righteousness. We can receive an ascribed status, a status before God where God says, you're honorable to me, even though you didn't achieve it. I'm just go going to give it to you. Okay, so let's keep going. So we're going to work through these really fast. Uh, through, we're going to look at these. We, we look at these all the time. Okay, understanding these these eight truths to understand the gospel more. Okay, so we're going to go through them real quick and see them in Romans 3. So we have to understand the eight truths below to better see and understand the gospel and the glory of Jesus. So I'm just showing you how do these fit in to, to uh, Romans 3 and what's happening to Jesus while he's hanging on the cross. So when Jesus says, it is finished, that was a lot that Jesus did to achieve our honor and our righteousness for us. There was a lot. Now the gospel, this, this is the thing about the gospel that's interesting. The gospel is simple, but it's not simple. <laughs> the gospel is, um, is uh, all that the gospel does is not simple. All that it took... The, the good news, gospel means good news, so all that it was that Jesus had to do for us to be acceptable to God, there's a lot there, and that's what we're looking at, okay? We can, we can learn more and more and more every day our whole life about the, the, the glory, the beauty of the gospel. And so it's, it's simple in that Jesus did everything for you, and you need to put your faith in Jesus, and you can be acceptable to God. You can be given ascribed honor. You can, you can be acceptable. Okay? But a lot had to happen. Jesus had to do a lot. Okay? So let's work through this. We're, we're still in Romans 3, but I want to talk through these because I've been, I, I spent the whole summer teaching you this uh, stuff on the gospel. Okay? But I want to remind you. Okay? Okay, so first of all, the first truth that we've talked about in, in these pictures and understanding the gospel is standard, that God's glory, his weight and fullness and likeness and honor, which is his uh, is love and respect of God, is the standard we should try and reach. God deserves the highest honor because of his glory, because of who God is. God is our creator and highest king. He deserves the highest honor. Honor has to do with price and value. You honor what is most valuable to you. So God, we should honor him above all. He should be the most valuable. The one we value and love the most is the one we will honor the most. The one we honor the most is also the one we will worship and obey. God requires full honor and devotion, which is full allegiance and commitment. And God requires us to be fully honorable to him to meet the standard for relationship with him. To be part of God's kingdom and in relationship with Him, we must continue to live our lives in full submission to His Lordship and in honoring Him. Now, this is what the goal, this is what should happen. We don't always do this. The highest measurement of our full love and obedience is called righteousness. We've talked about this. Righteousness is the perfect obedience and honor we should give to God. God's honor should always be our greatest target and goal in life. When we measure our glory, our likeness, and who we are, to God's glory, we do not measure up and meet the standard. Okay, so again, if we have to be righteous and honorable to be acceptable to God, we don't do this. We don't meet the standard. Back to Romans chapter 3. I'm just working through Romans 3, 20 through 26. Okay? So we saw that the law and the prophets show us what right, what, what, they point to what brings righteousness and brings honor to us as people. Okay, verse 23 of Romans 3, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we fall short of honoring God fully and perfectly. Okay, which leads to our next uh, truth that we've talked about. Okay. 
sin. Sin means to miss the mark. This idea is used when someone is trying to hit or a target when shooting an arrow from a bow or a bullet from a gun. The target is the highest mark to hit. Think of God's honor as the target that we should all strive to hit. We do not always bring honor to God and treat him with the highest respect he deserves. We should treat him as though he is our only king and God all the time. We should only strive to love and obey him above all. When we sin and disobey God, we are putting ourselves on the throne and wanting to take God's crown and put it on our own heads. We are saying to God, I want to rule my own life. To sin is to dishonor God in our hearts and to take him off the throne of our lives. So sin is simply just rebelling against the lordship, the, the kingship of God. A saint, uh, God, I don't want to obey you. I don't want to honor you. I want to honor myself. Okay? And we all have sin. Romans 3.23, we just read it, says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of honoring God with our lives. Okay? And that sin leads to shame. I'm just reminding you of all these truths so that when we look at the cross, we have to understand what Jesus is, is taking on himself. And what he has to go through to make us honorable and acceptable to God, okay? Our sin leads to shame. The word shame means to be dishonored, to lose face, to turn some, our face away in shame, okay? To blush, that means your cheeks turn red. When we sin and we do wrong and we get caught, someone finds out, man, we get embarrassed, we, we get shameful, our faces turn red. It says to, to blush with terror, to be scared and fearful. Shame always involves fear. Okay? It says uh, to be with terror, without hope, to be naked or fully exposed and seen in the sense that all sin and dishonor can be seen by God and others. Shame is to be disappointed, to be confused, not knowing what is happening and completely without, without hope of any honor. The Bible says that those who turn away from God, who are incensed against God, will be put to shame. They will go down to hell in the lake of fire and shame. Uh, Isaiah chapter 45. It says, those, Only those in the Lord shall be ascribed honor and righteousness. But those who are incensed or turn away from Him go down in shame. Shame is the result of sin and dishonoring of God as our highest king and ruler, when we disobey God and choose to go our own way, then we are trusting ourselves to be our own king and ruler, and this always leads to shame. When we see that our sin, our dishonor of God is seen by God, then we lose face. That means we, we bow our heads in, in shame. Okay? We turn our faces in shame and cannot hold our heads high. We, we cannot live in honor and respect. Because sin leads to shame. When we sin and dishonor, we deserve to be dishonored by God and put to shame. And that's where the good news is. Jesus, when he's hanging on the cross, he's being put to shame by the Father on our behalf. Because Jesus, the Lord, Isaiah 53, the Lord, Father, God, laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He didn't just lay our sins and our rebellion our, you know, our status on Jesus. He also laid on him the consequence, the, the punishment, the shame that we deserve. So Jesus was, was being treated as though he dishonored his father, even though he did not. Okay? And I'm continuing on. I'm sorry I'm going through this fast, although many of you don't think I'm going fast. <laughs> I don't even know what time I'm at. I don't see the time. Okay. All right, sin does not just lead to shame, but also to separation from God. Since God is righteous, God is perfectly honorable, He's perfectly right and fair, and He is deserving of the highest honor at all the time, He cannot be united to anyone or anything that is not honorable. Okay, if you have one kingdom, where you have one king, and you decide you don't want to be submissive to that king, and you go join another kingdom, so you rebel against 
that king, and you go join another kingdom, you can't be part of two kingdoms and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve two kings. That's not how king, kingship works. You don't have two kings. Okay, you have one king, and if you choose to, to rebel and go to another kingdom, be part of another kingdom, you can't be on the same team, on the same kingdom. Okay? It says this, God desires a relationship with us as his people, but God desires his own honor above all. God will sit on the throne and be king. He's not going to share him the highest place of honor. Now, as kingdom children of God, when we put our faith in him, and when he restores the full physical kingdom to this earth, we will share in his honor. But we're still, we're not God. We don't become gods. We become honored children, his creation. Okay? Because we dishonor God through disobedience and rebellion against his honor, then that leads to separation from God and separation from his kingdom. Honor and dishonor cannot mix, just as light and dark or black and white cannot mix without diluting or fading the other. If God were to live in unity with the dishonorable, then he would lose honor himself, and he will never do this. God will always keep his own honor. Okay? There is no sin or dishonor found in God. If there were, then he would stop maintaining his glory and the right to be honored above all else. God does not sin. God is perfectly honorable. God must separate himself from all that is dishonorable and shameful. Okay? So, what I want to do is, is look back. Okay, keeping all of this in mind, I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you. And as I've taught many of you in our church, it's like you're in Bible college. Even though it's church, I'm preaching to you. I'm trying to go deep and help you understand the... the really, this is like, you know, the Bible says there's milk, which is basic, and then there's meat. This seems like meat, but it's actually the basics of the gospel, that Jesus finished everything at the cross. Now, what that all entails is the meat that we're looking at. Like, how does that all work? Okay, but if you go back, think about in John 19, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he has, he has taken our sins on himself. He's taken our shame. He's hanging there. And in John 19, it does not record what we're going to read now that Matthew records. So, so John, it's, the, it's at the same time that Jesus is hanging there, right before he's about to die, okay? Jesus took, we talked about, he drank from the wine of the wrath of God. But let's look at, Math, how does Matthew record this scene where Jesus is hanging on the cross, okay? And right before Jesus says, it is finished, what does Matthew say that Jesus cried out to his father? Okay, John does, does not record this. Let's look at Matthew 27, 46 through 50. And what does this have to do with separation? Okay, we just looked at our sin leads to separation from God. Spiritual separation, relational separation, and ultimately one day in the lake of fire, actual physical separation from God. The Bible, Jesus said, you have a, bell, a body in hell. He said in Matthew, Fear God who has the power to destroy both body and soul in hell. So we do have a body in hell. Jesus said it. Okay, so we deserve to be separated from God the Father. Okay, so let's look at Matthew 27, 46 through 50. I don't need to turn there. Stay in Romans. We're going back to Romans 3. I know I'm jumping around a lot, as I told you, but I'm trying to tie all this in with how did Jesus finish the work completely where it never has to be done again? So Matthew 27, 46 through 50, it says, now Jesus is hanging on the cross. This is right before he drinks the wine that's given to him. Jesus says this. It says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which is in Aramaic. This is not a language that uh, even people back then not everyone spoke it. it. It means, 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's crying out to his father. Now, Jesus has been through terrible suffering. He's been beaten on the back. He's, he's got nails in his hands and feet. Every time you want to, to take a breath, just to breathe, you have to, you have to push up on those nails and pick yourself up just so you can take some breath in your lungs and then you go back down. It's excruciating, terrible pain. That's the physical pain. But Jesus is experiencing worse than the physical pain, the anguish of his soul, as Isaiah 53 says. Okay? Preach it, baby. Preach it. Okay? So, Jesus is hanging there, and he cries to his Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What does the word forsaken mean? Okay? This word forsaken means... To be, to be separated from, to be, to be abandoned, to be, to be pushed away. Now, there are, there are people that, um, even Christians now, they have like this, I'm, I'm hearing about it, reading about it, this new theology that, that God the Father didn't punish Jesus when he died on the cross. Okay, now God the Father, and they say, well, if you believe that, you believe God is like a, uh, a child, he abused his own child. Okay, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely crazy. If God just, the Father, abandoned Jesus forever and ever and ever and just left him alone and turned him away, yes, that would be, that would be uh, terrible. But we know the end of the story. Three days later, Jesus' honor before his Father is restored at the resurrection. I mean, he, he he's, it's like a, the Bible says the gospel is like a, it's like a mystery. How does this work? God the Father has to separate his, his son, Jesus, while he's on the cross. Jesus is saying it here. You can't say that God the Father didn't pour judgment out on Jesus. Okay? Isaiah 53 said, The Lord, Father, name, laid our iniquities on him, on him. He laid our sin and the consequence of our sin, which is his wrath against sin. So Jesus was punished by his Father. Okay, and the punishment, the ultimate punishment is the shame. So Jesus was put to shame and the separation from his father, which is the worst anguish that anyone can have. In, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, it says those who do not uh, believe in the gospel, they don't know God, they don't believe the gospel, they are separated from God and the glory of his mind. Okay, so... Jesus was going through the separation because that's what we deserve. And he substituted himself in our place. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the iniquity, the sins of us all, are being laid on Jesus. And he has to be treated for those sins the way that we would be treated. He has to be, God the Father has to separate himself from Jesus. So Jesus is being forsaken by his Father. His Father is having to turn his face away from him, pour out judgment and wrath and shame. He has to be separated from his his son, okay? And Jesus was willing to go through this. And we know that God did this because he loves us. It says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his son to do this. Jesus volunteered to go through this. John 10, he said, I lay my life down. No one takes it from me. I will lay it down and I will take it up again. Okay, so we have to understand Jesus is taking the weight of our sin and our rebellion and our dishonor of God. He's being treated as though he dishonored his father. Even though he did not, Jesus never dishonored his father. But he's treated as if he did because he's taking our sins. Okay, I'm going to continue on. So Jesus is becoming our substitution or his whole life was a, sub, a substitution. His perfect, honorable life achieved the honor for us. If Jesus ever sinned, he would have lost honor. But Jesus never sinned, okay? A substitution is an exchange of one thing for another or someone taking the place of someone else. Just like Splenda is a substitute for sugar or a football player substitutes for another player on a field 
Sometimes an exchange of places is necessary for good. Jesus, who is the Lord God, he's God the Son, in human body became a substitution for us. Philippians 2 says, Jesus, who being in the very nature God, took on human flesh, okay, being in the very nature of God, was made in the likeness of men, took on human flesh, humbled himself even to the death of the cross, it says in Philippians 2. So Jesus came and put on human skin. He became a substitute for sinners, for us, for us who are dishonorable. God knows that we as people continuously live a life of shame and dishonor, rebelling against his commands, and we continue to seek to be our own kings. Okay? Now we're back in Romans 3. Like I said, I know it feels like we're jumping around a lot. That's why I wanted you to just stay in your Bibles in Romans 3. I'm kind of explaining what's going on. Okay? Verses 24 and uh, 25. It says this. Verse 23 said, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we've all dishonored God. We, we have not achieved honor because we're sinful we can't achieve it verse 24 says and all are justified so all are declared honor honorable all are ascribed or given the place of honor and given righteousness by his grace as a gift becoming honorable to god and and being ascribed honor is it's a gift that god gives to us by his grace getting what we don't deserve through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Okay, so what this is saying is a propitiation, propitiation means to satisfy. And we talked about this last week. When Jesus drank the wine from the wrath of God, okay, spiritually, he takes on our sins on himself and he consumes it, he drinks it. That's what's called the propitiation. He satisfies it. When he takes away, if God's wrath could be put in a cup, as God's word says, you know, the cup of the wine of the wrath of God, and if the cup is full of all the punishment and shame and sin, separation from God, it's all put in here, and Jesus consumes it all, he satisfies God's wrath, and God, God was able to be just and and pour out judgment, but he just poured it out on Jesus instead of on us who have faith in him. Okay, so he was the propitiation, the satisfaction by his blood. He took all of our sins. This was to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. So Jesus is showing that he is honorable and he ascribes that honor to us. He gives it to us. Because he achieved that honor through his life, his death, and his resurrection. I know I'm going long here, but I'm almost done, if you can believe it. Okay, 2 Corinthians, don't turn there. Uh, 5.21 says, For our sake he made him, God the Father, made Jesus to be sin, to be treated as he had sinned, Jesus was substituting himself in our place and treated as a sinner. Okay? So 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, he became sin. So look at this picture here. It's called, you know, it's the divine substitution of Christ or the exchange of Christ for us. Okay? So Jesus, who is righteous, if you look on the right there at the top, says Jesus is righteous. Jesus is perfectly honorable. He puts himself in our place, and he is treated as though he's not righteous. Okay, 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. So Jesus, who is righteous, is putting himself in our place and treated as though he is a sinner. Okay, look at point number two. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that in Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesus became sin. He was treated as though he had sinned. So that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. We might become 
honorable to God. We can be given ascribed honor. God will give his honor to us and we can be acceptable to God. Jesus was substituting himself in our place so that we could be treated as though we are righteous. 1 Peter 3.18, the first part says, He suffered for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus is righteous. He suffered for us who are not righteous. That he may bring us to God. That he may bring us fully honorable and acceptable to God. To be accepted in God's sight. Jesus went through everything on that cross. He's finishing the work. He's achieving the honor that only he can achieve. We could never achieve this honor on our own. Okay, Jesus is doing that for us. He's substituting himself in our place. Okay, so let's go back to the truth of substitution that we see in three, and we see this at the cross in John 19. Because of God's desire to restore his honor and our relationship with him, he was willing to come down to earth to make a way for our honor to be restored and for us to be seen as though we have always honored him. This is the good news, that we do not honor God. We are sinful. But Jesus came to make us honorable, acceptable to God. Jesus, who is God and deserves to be honored in the place of God and King, humbled himself and took on the form of a man. As I mentioned before in uh, Philippians 2, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but rather he was made in the likeness of men. Okay? He humbled himself, put on human flesh, and became obedient even to death on a cross. That's what Philippians 2 says. So Jesus humbled himself. He lived a righteous, honorable life, perfectly honoring God and the Father. And Jesus never sinned, but he was willing to substitute himself for us because he wanted to restore God's honor. You know, in the Old Testament, it says many times, God says, I will restore you, Israel. I will restore you, my people who have rebelled against me, not for your sake, but for my glory. So what it said, you can read it all in the prophets. God cares about his own honor. And he cares about us too. But he, say, he says, you can read it. I, I don't have the, the scripture up where he says that. But it's many places in the prophets. I am not restoring you for your own sake, but for my own glory. That my name will be known among the peoples. Okay. Back to Romans 3. Again, we're just moving through this passage in Romans 3. So verse 26, so Jesus, he, he comes, he substitutes his life for us. He's dying on the cross. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, so here's what's happening. When Jesus is dying on the cross... He's, he's taking our dishonor of him. He's taking our sins, our unrighteousness on himself. Okay, and it says here to show his righteousness, part of God's uh, character and who he is as a righteous God is that he has to be just, which means he has to punish sin. He has to carry out judgment upon sin. God has to. It's part of his nature. If, if God just sits back in heaven on his throne and he watches sin and rebellion and wickedness go on on the earth and he does not do anything about it, that, is, that would not be a good God, a just God. And God is good and God is just and he always does what is right. So it says here, when Jesus dies on the cross, God was able to, to, to do what he does. He was able to be just. He was able to carry out punishment for us. But guess what God did? He was still able to be just. He just, Jesus drank the justice. He drank the punishment. He drank the shame that we deserve. He consumed it. 
And so God the Father was able to, to continue to live in his, his justice, but he just carried out the punishment on Jesus instead of carrying it out on us. So that's why it says, it was so that he might be just, and the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus. Justifier, again, all just and justifier come from the chaos. It's a different form. Remember, the chaos is to justify, to declare someone honorable, to ascribe righteousness to someone. Okay? So God can be the justifier of us who have faith in Jesus. He will ascribe honor. He will give us righteousness because Jesus achieved it. So Jesus achieved our honor for us. Okay? Now I'm going to go through this real quick. If we put our faith in him, we can receive this achieved honor. Because, I'm sorry, we can receive the ascribed honor that Jesus achieved. Jesus worked and completed the work at the cross. Okay? If we put our faith in him, saving faith is to confess or admit that Jesus is Lord, God, and trust his perfect, honorable life and death and resurrection was sufficient to restore our relationship with God and to make us to be seen as though we honor him. Because Jesus received the shame and separation from his Father that we deserve, he satisfied God's honorable justice or his right to judge sin and all that is dishonorable. God carried out the due punishment of shame and separation we deserve for our sin and for our rebellion. He carried that out on Jesus at the cross. Jesus took away the dishonor that we deserve to receive. Amen? It's through faith in Jesus. Jesus achieved the honor. Jesus was righteous. So that we could receive salvation. We could have our honor restored. If we honor Jesus as our only Lord God and put him back on the throne of our hearts, then he offers to share his honorable righteous record with us and makes us honorable to God. Because Jesus honored God with his perfect life, death, and resurrection, then he is able to restore us to a place where God only sees us as though we have only ever honored him. So when God looks at you, he doesn't look at your, your past sin anymore. When you come to faith in Jesus, he sees you as perfectly honorable. The way he intended you to be when he created all of creation, he created us to live in honor and to, to, to rule with him and reign with him in his kingdom on this earth. And he will restore that. We will rule and reign with him. Okay? This is the great exchange or the substitution that Jesus offers to all who believe and trust in him. Through faith in Jesus and following him as our only Lord brings salvation. Jesus gives his glory or his honor as a righteous person to us and takes away the punishment and shame and separation from God that we deserve for dishonoring God through disobeying his commands. So Jesus restores honor to us. Okay, so back, just to kind of review what we've seen in Romans, and we're going to go back to the cross now, when Jesus says, it is finished. Notice Romans 3.22. Okay, I, I put the wrong scripture up here. It's Romans 3.22, not Romans 3.20. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus for all who believe. You can be given and you can be given honor you can be given righteousness you can be acceptable to God not because you've achieved any kind of honor it's because Jesus achieved it for you Jesus finished the work of bringing us to God and making us acceptable to God and we can be given ascribed honor it's like I've explained this to you many of you who have come from uh, your cultures with the caste system and some of you maybe were born in a higher caste and so you were ascribed honor from birth I mean you you were just born into that place of honor in your family and some of you are from maybe the lowest caste or in the middle I don't know where you're the caste you're from and so that was ascribed honor to you and there was nothing you could do to achieve honor out of that 
as far as I know, maybe if you move away to another country and come out of that, okay, if you become part of another kingdom system, okay, so think about this, Jesus, okay, we're before Christ, in our sin, we are dishonorable and we're in the lowest caste. And if we're in this low caste, like in, in your cultures, like in Buddhism or Hinduism, you're trying to achieve and have good karma, right? You're trying to do good. You want good karma so that in the next life, then maybe you can achieve a higher place of honor. And then in the next life, maybe you can achieve a, a higher place of honor. And then, of course, as you know, in, in, your, uh, in the religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, Hinduism, you're trying to become one with Brahma, the, the, the gods, or whatever, right? And then in Buddhism, you're trying to just reach the, the place of, of nirvana and just kind of like be at peace with the earth, right? And, and vanish. So you're trying to achieve honor through your good karma. Okay, now the Bible doesn't teach about karma, but Jesus achieved this honor for us. And no matter what good things we do, we cannot achieve this highest place of honor. So imagine if you are born into the lowest caste and you want, I mean, your goal, you, you want to be in the highest caste, right? I mean, you want to be honored. Well, think about God's kingdom. God's kingdom, we're born in another kingdom in the lowest caste as sinners fallen short of the glory and honor of God. Well, all of us are in the, the low caste apart from God's kingdom. And so Jesus, what he does is he comes and he achieves this honor for us. And then if you put your faith in him and acknowledge him to be your only Lord God and you confess that, and you choose to trust in him as your Lord and your Savior, okay? He ascribes to you the highest place of honor in his kingdom. He transfers you from the kingdom of darkness, from the lowest caste, into the highest caste, the kingdom of God. And he gives you, he ascribes to you honor as God's kingdom children. The highest place of honor we will rule and reign with Christ, the Bible says, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever in the new heaven and the new earth. And when he returns and sets up his kingdom on this earth for 1,000 years, it says we will rule and reign with him in that kingdom on this earth. So, going back to, run, I'm sorry, to John 19. I know I jumped around a lot today. Okay, I don't normally like to do that. I like to move slowly through passages, but... When Jesus said, it said, knowing that all was finished, okay, he drinks from the wine of the wrath of God. Earlier in, in Matthew, we looked at Jesus cries out, Father, you've, you've separated yourself from me. You're, you've forsaken me. Okay, and then Jesus, he recognizes it at this point. He's getting ready to die and give up his own spirit, his soul. Okay, he's going to die, Sep be separated from his body. He says, it is finished. Everything that was required to achieve our honor before God was achieved by Jesus. And if you remember, I talked about this word, tetelestai, at the beginning. This word in Greek, it is finished. It's one word, and it, it, it's, in, it's called... I remember the, the grammatical form. It's called a, a perfect passive verb. Perfect passive means this is something that has been done. Perfect. It's, it's happened. Passive means it's not something we do. It's something that someone else does for us. Okay? Perfect passive is something that has been done for you that never, ever needs to be done again. Okay, so Jesus achieved your honor for you when he lived his life, his perfect life. He died the death that we deserve. He achieved the place of honor for us, and he will ascribe that to us. Okay, Jesus ascribes that to us if we put our trust in him. 
Now, again, I don't, there's people who are watching this channel every week. I mean, I've, I've seen, some of you maybe have seen messages. Some people are like, you're crazy. Um, I have a, another um, Facebook page that I also have. I can't remember what they put, but I have different people from Nepal and India, and they're like, you Christians are crazy, and you know, you can't be saved through Jesus, okay? People are hearing the gospel, okay? So right now, if you're listening and you say, you know what? I know I could never achieve my own honor. I'm, I don't have good karma, <laughs> whether you think you do or not. The Bible says we all have bad karma. We all are sinful. We all are rebellious against God, okay? The question is, would you like to receive this honorable status? Would you like to be acceptable to God? Okay, the Bible says you, you can know. You can be saved from your unrighteousness, from your dishonor, from your shame. Okay, Romans 10, 9, 11. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can bow your head right now and ask Jesus. You can confess to Jesus, you are the Lord. Yes, Jesus, I accept you. I trust you, Jesus. I turn from my idols. I turn from my sin. I turn from my dishonorable ways. And I turn to Jesus who, who only makes me honorable. You can do that. If you're watching this and you've not become a Christian, this is how you become Christian. You acknowledge Jesus as the Lord and that he is the king and that that he died for you so that you could be honorable to God. And he rose again, as we're going to get to next week. The good news, the really good news, Jesus rose from the dead three days later. So you can acknowledge Jesus right now. And if I would challenge you to do that if you have not. Okay, so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to actually sing some. So, God, we come before you. I praise you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Jesus that you finished the work at the cross. You finished the work of bringing us to a place where we could be righteous in your sight so that we could be acceptable, Lord. And you want a relationship with us. You created us to be part of your kingdom. You love us. You don't want us to be part of the kingdom of darkness. And so we thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you for your sacrifice. We praise you that the work is finished, never needing to be done again. Jesus, you did everything. And we, we trust you, Lord. I pray if there's someone out there who has not acknowledged you as their Lord, that they would accept you right now, Lord Jesus, and co confess you to be their Lord. And so, Lord, we just uh, praise you. We thank you for all that you're doing. Continue to reveal yourself, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs>